for those who are watching the video or listening to the to the podcast, I just want to welcome you to a really special edition. At least it's really special for me. Um, <laughs> special edition of uh, music and mentorship. Uh, I'm getting to talk to to somebody that I've looked up to for many years and listened to his music for many years. And we're we're interviewing today a guy named Soup the Chemist. Um, his the name his mama gave him uh, is Chris, but we're going to be calling him Soup today. I wanted to kind of go old school and call him Super C because that was what I first came to know him as. He was Super C whenever I first heard him. But um, uh, yeah. we're going to talk with him a little bit about his music and about his art and about the impact that it's had on my life specifically and hopefully many others as well. Um, Soup really was the originator, man, like uh, specifically in Christian uh, hip hop circles like he was revolutionary like he opened up doors for people that are still benefiting from it today uh guys like you know triple e and lecrae and nf like they they have no idea what it was like in the 90s like and and the doors that they opened specifically into um christian churches and and people that normally wouldn't listen to this music and uh like these guys owe you a real debt of gratitude uh for all the hard work that you put in uh, during those years, and and uh, I, I certainly benefited from it. Um, the first SFC album that I got was A Saved Man. Um, okay. I loved it, and it kind of mixed the, uh, you know, 80s rap was really fun, uh, just kind of that Run DMC kind of style, but it mixed right. it uh, with just kind of a, a flavor of what was coming in the 90s. And then I got A Saved Man, and uh, like, at that time in my life, I was in high school and I was listening to secretly, I was secretly listening to MWA and Public Enemy uh, in my parents' Christian household. And, uh, you know, they, they didn't know, but I love the energy of the music. Uh, but Correct. I also found that some of the message, I did, it didn't resonate with me because I was trying to live my life for Christ and the right. message didn't resonate with me. And then I got a hold of the SFC. And I was like, wait a minute, like this has the same energy of the stuff that I like. And it's also the same quality of music of the stuff that I like, because I've tried to explain to these guys how rap previous to SFC really was not on the same level. Um, but it had that same level of quality, but yet it inspired me to be bold about my faith. And that was a really important time for me because uh, boldness uh, was something that is really hard for a high school student uh, trying to share his faith with his friends, yeah, yeah. Trying to, you know, meet people on the street and share your faith with them with in a way that's not like cheesy or chases them away. And like, I feel like that specifically this album gave me a lot of boldness. And, you know, I talked about, you know, these rappers today owing you, you a great uh, debt of gratitude, but I think I do too, because it was that it was this album that helped me to have the courage to share my faith with my friends. And now I'm, on, I'm a missionary in Africa and that's pretty much what I do for a living, you know? I mean, so yeah, it was yeah, there that yeah, it all yeah. started for me saying this is important enough and I'm gonna stand on what I believe in here, uh, even though it may not be a popular opinion. So I owe you a debt of gratitude as well. And I wanted to say thank you before we really kind of kicked into the questions. Well, I appreciate that, man. Thank you, man. Those are very kind words, sir. <laughs> well, could you start off by maybe uh, giving us just kind of a synopsis of your testimony and how you came to, to know the Lord? Almost oh, definitely, man. Uh, uh, well, I, I didn't grow up in a church. I wasn't, you know, uh, even a, a guy who was into Christianity. I studied all type of religions. I, I was in a Jehovah's Witness. Then I got into metaphysics. And, uh, you know, I was just seeking and uh, some things, things happen on the streets, you know, how the streets are. And it, and it uh, it's like it was confirmation on some of the things that I have been studying about, you know, the way God moves and stuff. And at that, what happened was I was in a street fight and got hit in the head with a bat. And uh, right before that, though. This cat at, uh, that I was growing up with uh, came. We would we would have these deep spiritual discussions, and uh, he 
he was just telling me, uh, he was confirming something that my grandmother had told me mm-hmm. that uh, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be out there spreading the word of God. And I was like, but who is God? You know, I'm still on my mission. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then he's like, uh, no, this God that I'm talking about right here, you know, you're going to be out there. And I didn't really, you know, I was just listening to him talk because these are the conversations we would have. But then that night when I went home, I, it was like the spirit of God just really started speaking to me. And all this stuff that I was studying, I just all noticed it all. Every one of these religions broke away on this one certain part when it came to who Jesus is and the Godhead. And it was just, it was just all this stuff was coming like, yo, what is this, man? You know, why is everybody almost kind of equal until it gets to this one little part, you know? And that, and I would just remember praying that night, you know, God, you know, help me really understand what I'm doing. You know, this stuff really doesn't make sense to me. And I, I you know, I'm, I'm being pure with you. That week, I hit the streets and get, get into this crazy fight, get hit in the head with this bat. And uh, it didn't really kick in until I was at the doctor and he, he was checking me out. This whole left side of my face was numb. I couldn't even move it. And uh, the doctor started checking it out and he was saying, you know, from the impact of your blow, you should have had internal bleeding in your head. You don't have that, we're gonna operate. We, we, we scanned your head and the, the, the bone that should have did this damage, we, we don't even see it in your head right now. <laughs> so it was just like, what? <laughs> so I was tripping out on that, right? <laughs> so then the operation was 11 hours. I came out and uh, as soon as I got out, you know, I got serious and gave my life. It was like God was showing me, look, man, I, I guess I got to hit you in your head. Had to make you wake up. <laughs> so <laughs> I went to church and really didn't understand what I was going and going and just lit, letting the word get in me. I used to, you know, be out. Like I said, I, I was in these streets. I used to DJ in the streets, all that. I gave all my stuff away, quit the group. I was actually rapping. I quit that group, told them I want to, you know, just concentrate on this new lifestyle that I'm accepting. And this went on for like six months. Nothing but me, word of God, going to church. And uh, I started feeling weird, man. I started like really, cause I love, I'm a, I'm a music dude, but I don't like choir music. So I was kind of going crazy in church. I didn't have nothing to listen to. And I was like, yo, what is this, man? I can't stand choir music. And uh, then uh, I was married at the time. My wife tells me, she said, you know, uh, Maybe you should write about your experiences. And I said, wow, that's a trip. Like, like kind of like some Christian rap stuff. And she was like, yeah, you know, whatever is going on and you write about it. And so I started doing it, but it was only for me. I wasn't trying to give it out to anybody or, you know, look at it as anything. I was just doing this stuff for me. And uh, what happened was uh, while I was, while I was writing and, recording doing i mean it was so ghetto i have i don't know if you guys are familiar with pause mixing is but it wasn't even a uh it wasn't even a four track i was doing pause mixes where <laughs> we got two cassette decks and and you you play the beat uh-huh. rewind it play the beat <laughs> this is how i was doing my songs right so while in the room i was listening to this uh there was this uh hip-hop station that would play stuff so i was kind of just trying to hear what was out what's going on and uh there was this radio, this cat on the radio, and he's he's he he has this crazy New York accent, and he and in between the songs he would say stuff about God, and I'm like, yo, man, what this dude like uh, hearing me in my room right now? What's going on, <laughs> right? So I'm like, I so I wrote the call letters down, and I called the dude up, and I said, hey man, I'm really digging your style, man, and I'm listening to you. But I'm what I'm what's really what I'm really calling, man. It's like in between all these songs that you're playing, you keep dropping these little uh gems about God and stuff, man. I said, uh, what's 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 up? He goes, Oh yeah, man, I'm a Christian, man. And he said, What's what's up with you? I said, I'm a Christian too, man. I'm like, I'm actually sitting here writing some 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 gospel rhymes as I'm I'm talking. He says, Man, I, I did a gospel CD. I said, What? 
He said, I'm working on it. Well, he said, I'm working on a gospel CD. I said, well, man, we need to connect. The dude came, after he finished that show that night, he came to my house, man, picked me up, took me to his house, and we recorded a song that night. Wow. And that was the beginning of SFC, man. <laughs> I'm sorry, brother. Who was the guy that, that came? Was it the Q3? guy that actually uh, picked me up? You're probably uh, familiar with. Uh, he started a group called JC and the Boys. He yeah. went by MC Scroller. Yeah, that's crazy. That's, man. that's, that's, great that's the dude that that's the dude that put put this whole thing together and got the ball rolling. Wow. Yeah, well, man. So I was doing my research and uh, trying to look through a bunch of old stuff on YouTube. And uh, I found some fun stuff, man. Some old school stuff from the 90s. Uh, yeah. In one interview, you mentioned some of the stuff that you used to do with Rosie Greer, who yeah, I've never yes. heard of him. So I did research on him. That was an interesting dude, man. Uh, but Very I was kind of hear the kind of, what did, what did you guys do during that time? And like, what was your mission? Well, as, yeah, as we got going and SFC became, you know, a, th a thing, we uh, began to do a street ministry uh with victory outreach and we were doing and we would go out on flatbeds and they would take us out into like some of the roughest neighborhoods and we would just rhyme and you know of course you know rap of tracks so <laughs> we would do the rapping and then they would do the uh the fishing you know so uh there were some people out there uh from rosie greer's ministries and they were like man you know we would like to uh connect with you and take you to some of the neighborhoods we go to. Because uh, Victory Outreach is geared towards most of the Latino community. So Rosie Greer was taking us to the hood. <laughs> and uh, so that's how that came to be. And man, they were deep. So it was the same movement though. Uh, they would go into these neighborhoods, put us on a flatbed with a sound system. We start rapping, like literally, right in the middle of the neighborhood, they would just come out, check us out. Someone would just come out of their door and just sit right there and watch us. And, and then, you know, after that, they would, uh, while we're rapping, they would have a team walking around, you know, giving out uh, pamphlets or trying to, you know, explaining them what we're doing, what we're talking about. So, uh, you know, they were planting them seeds, man. And then uh, what would happen was uh, with the people that would respond, and were really into what we were doing, they would uh, set up uh, a way to come and get them and take them to churches. It was pretty deep. Cool. Yeah, so that, that, that was Rosie Greer's get down, man. And he was in the toughest neighborhoods in LA, Nicholson Gardens, Jordan Downs, Compton, you know, all that stuff. You said you listen to NWA, all that stuff they rapped about, that's where we were really at. <laughs> yeah. That's cool, man. And I, like I said, I looked him up. The dude was serious, man. Like, oh, he was no joke. That was crazy. And so I thought it was pretty cool. You know, you don't see, you don't see people giving their lives like that full, full on. Just saying, you know what? Because he, he had, he could have done something totally different with his life. He could have been rich, famous, um, but you know, he decided to give back to his neighborhood. And I just thought it was a really cool thing. Well, this podcast that we're doing, yeah, uh, Rosie Grill is a deep brother. Tomorrow, it's focusing on the album Phase Three, like I mentioned before. Um, I'd like to know uh, musically what were your influences, not just musically, even culturally. Like, what were your main influences uh, for all all three of you guys whenever uh, you were recording and producing uh, Phase Three? Uh, you know, I can't really pinpoint and say this was my inspiration because the, there's so much emotion on the on that, you know, that record is it's the emotions is always changing. So I, I feed off of everything, you know, I'm really deeply into jazz, you know, I like abstract stuff. So I think that's what comes apart, sets me apart when you hear my style, because I can, I'm, I'm influenced heavily by jazz. And I, I picture myself when I'm doing my patterns of rhyming, like even a guy on the saxophone, you know, I try to write like that. So my, my patterns are never just straight. You know, I try to write a beat like a sax player would do. Yeah. So uh, that's that's probably, if I was gonna, you know, say I'm influenced the most, it's probably by uh, 
jazz, a lot of uh, abstract jazz. Like one of my favorite groups is the Jazz Crusaders. You know what I'm saying? And they were uh, they were like the innovators of uh, a lot of styles that people took and tried to make their own. They were responsible for that. And uh, I would always, when I would ever get, whenever I would get like writer's block and, and kind of stuck, I would always go to those albums and just sit there and listen to the way they rock in and the energy and it would open me up and you know there was and then I would listen to a lot of uh poetry a lot of cats kicking poetry and stuff so you know I was all over the place man and then when I uh you know of course I would have when I wanted to get very spiritual with it I would just you know kick back and listen to some sermons and try to understand where I'm coming from and what people are into you know so the emotions was always no different. I can't really uh, say it just there. <laughs> no I'm sorry. There, right? No Carmen, man. <laughs> no choir? You said no choir music? No choir music. <laughs> no choir music, man. <laughs> well, yeah. Caroline's got a question for you. Yeah, so we were wondering kind of what you would describe as some themes of the album. What were some you know, main points that you felt like you were hitting with the lyrics as you were writing it and producing it? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I wanted to, uh, how, I, let me see how to word this correctly. My whole goal on that record, which is was our slogan, was raising a nation that will obey. That was my whole point. But we wanted to do it in a straight up hip hop way. We didn't want it. When you heard us, you can say, you can't say nothing, but yo, those dudes are hip hop. Mm -hmm. That was my goal. So, I mean, you know, yeah, we, we put Jesus all over it, but I've, I've never, uh, they didn't know, it was so, it was so uh, hip hop that they, they, that even Epic Records, which was a mainstream label, they didn't even know how to, they didn't know how to market us because they said, well, I don't even know if we can call this Christian because it's so hip hop, but yet we can't call it hip hop because it's so Christian. They didn't even know what to do. <laughs> so that that was my goal. I was like, man, we're just going to do what we know and represent who we really are. And that was raising a nation that will obey. That's what we did. And here we are, what, 28 years later, boom, yeah. people still feeling it. <laughs> Awesome. And that actually leads into a question I have. So it has, it's been 28 years since the album came out. I was born in 1996, so I wasn't around mm -hmm. in 92. But just knowing some history right. stuff, like 92 or 93, that whole time where, where like the LA riots, everything went down with Rodney King. So I'm curious how, from your perspective, this album coming out like right in the midst and right after all of that compares with 2020 and just your, some of your thoughts on like the current state of things um, socially and comparatively. Your question is, how does this out if this album still compares to that? What's going on now? Is that, he's asking? I'm, like, I want to make sure I understand. Compare, compare socially the way things were in '92 with how they are right now in 2020, um, because you know he was mentioning that the LA riots happened and all those things were happening around. Oh, okay, time. yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, it, that's pretty weird because to me, it seems like the same junk is going on that was going on there. We were riding then, we're marching now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Racism was crazy then, it's crazy now. Police brutality back then, is police brutality right now. Uh, people, you know, it's just, only thing that has changed is social media has brought all this garbage to the forefront. Nothing's really changed. It's actually, to me, it's actually got worse. And, but now everyone sees versus before you, you had to be around to really see, you know, everybody has cameras, everybody's filming, everybody's posting, every, posting their thoughts, posting, you know, their beliefs. There's just, there's just crazy stuff all over the internet. You know, people are just, and people don't even think, they just grab whatever you have this certain emotion if somebody's 
talking or posting something that's even a little bit on your level, all of a sudden it's truth. You're jumping on it. You know, you don't even study it. It's just crazy right now. So these are, uh, that's the stuff we were talking back then. We were talking about that stuff back then. You know, I even wrote a song on that album called Freedom and Captivity. And that's exactly what is going on. A lot of people think they're free, but they are free. Freedom in captivity because they don't even understand that they're free in this lie. They're free in a lie. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. totally. yeah. yeah. Well, like, um, one question I've got, you know, uh, modern hip hop is uh, very different today uh, than it was back in the 80s and 90s. And yeah. I, I always thought, I mean, even in serious albums, it was fun, you know, and I feel like now hip hop is just so serious that it took all the fun out of it. And I still enjoy it, but like I was listening to, to this album today and kind of in preparation for, for the podcast tomorrow. And I was in my room, my kids were, were walking around, I got my headphones on and I'm going to tell you the honest to God, my neck is sore from bobbing my head to this music. Cause it's just fun. It makes you want to move. It makes you want to dance, but it's also, you're dealing with serious topics and, and sometimes going around to talk about it and using a lot of creativity. Uh, but also there were like on this album, there were a lot of silly moments, you know, like one, yeah. and another one and the Skanookids. And so like, I'm really curious as to what was going on yeah. <laughs> yeah. that produced all of this crazy well, stuff. <laughs> Well, you know, we're, we're, we're jokesters, man. Me, me and my crew, I like, you know, to keep, because I was, I was kind of a, I was a, how could I say? I, I was pretty stern about certain things, man. Like when we're being on time was a big thing with mine, you know, uh, going to our product tables after we perform was a big thing with me, you know? So I was, you know, I was serious, but at the same time I was, a clown man a clown especially on the road we were clowns we were enjoying life you know uh because uh that's that's what it, that's just what it was about man you know we 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 were out there in them streets and being all mad and it, what for what man you know what what why we got to come with let's let's enjoy life we're clowning man so that's when we get in there yeah we're straight clowns dude throwing water on each other all kind of stuff <laughs> So it was just fun, man. It was fun times. Uh, and it was uh, really, you know, when I think back on it, you know, it was some pretty good memories, man. And, uh, you know, we have, we've lost a couple of cats. And just being able to uh, look back and all that clowning and, you know, that, that's, those are good memories instead of, you know, all serious and bad. And, you know, and, yo, you know, yeah. nah, man, let's have fun. Yeah. Let's enjoy life. We're happy. We're saved, man. That's cool, man. Um, so I, I really feel like, you know, SFC was kind of the, the forerunner to what's popular with this generation um, has been Lecrae and what is it? 116 Click. But he's, you know, with Reach Records, he's trying to get all these guys together uh, that are all Christian rappers mm -hmm. and kind of create this community. But like you were doing that back in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and like I was trying to explain to these guys that like SFC wasn't Soup and QP and Dove. Like there were all these other dudes that were kind of in and out of there. Yeah. Um, and y'all were all trying to do the same. There were seven, seven. It was a total of 75 of us. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> But I mean, that's a movement, man. That's, and, and especially whenever nobody else was doing it. And so like, I would really just like to hear like, what was it like in those early days whenever Christians, churches, uh, you know, record labels, when they didn't know what to do with you, like, was it discouraging? You know, when, cause I mean, I, Christian rock and Christian rap were both kind of coming out at the same time in both of them, in most churches, including my home church, uh, they were all like, yeah, you can't listen to this you know, and we all did anyway, right. but, you know, I'm sure there were a lot of folks that weren't allowing people to listen to really good, solid music. So like, what was it like for you guys, all of y'all, whenever, you know, you weren't being accepted by the people who, you know, you, you were like them, but yet they wouldn't accept you. Well, Jay, first you got to understand our attitude. 
we we were from the streets and we started out doing our music in the streets so when the churches were tripping on us we were like we're not really trying to go over there with you anyway you know <laughs> <laughs> and so we're we're trying to reach these cats that don't go to church all you guys are sitting in church we're just just entertaining you so we're not really moved if you don't want us over there and I I would get into people on the radio stations like when when we first started like that all the time and when I would tell them like that they they didn't know what to say it's like we're not we're not here to go to your church yeah. that's not what we're trying to do and once they really understood that they they couldn't keep us out of the church you know what I'm saying <laughs> I was trying not to be up in those churches all the time because to tell you the truth Jake it was like entertaining Christians, yeah. you know what I mean? And yeah. that that's not really what I wanted to do. So it was kind of a, it's kind of, it was kind of opposite for me. That started depressing me. Yeah. I wanted to get out in the streets. I wanted to get, I wanted people uh, who don't go to church, who don't know what's happening. I wanted them to hear what we're doing. Yeah. And, uh, but when we rolled, and we did hit those churches. We we were like seventy deep up in those churches. <laughs> I, <laughs> so they yeah they when they when they invited us, I brought whoever wanted to come with me, man. Yeah. I mean, and that picture, if you look on that picture on the album Phase Three, yeah, you can't even see all the people that were there. The, the camera couldn't even capture all the people. So that's how we used to roll. It was a big family, man. It was it wasn't like it is kind of like the movement is turning in today. It's, it's more of a competition thing. And, you know, nobody's really looking. Nah, man, we, we, we looked out for each other. We helped each other get deals, you know. And, uh, you know, I, since I was, you know, kind of the first dude, kind of older than a lot of the cats, you know, they did kind of look up to me as far as uh, the way things were going and how they how how to handle yourself how to how to get how to do these how to do a show how to how to even book a show you know how to get in a studio some of these cats they never even been in a studio so you know i would i would take them along with me and they would you know they would just chill watch the, the process and you know watch us perform do our thing you know i didn't just grab cats and put them on stage because that's a no-no you don't know who you're talking to you know but once <laughs> but once once i once they were around, you saw their heart, what they were really about, what was going on, you know, they, this, it, it began to, it began to burn within them. And they took, they kind of took from what, you know, I taught them and did their own thing. You know, you had all, you got all those crews out there, dynamic twins used to roll with me, gospel gangsters, uh, idol King. You had, uh, Freedom of Soul. Yeah, crazy. I know all and, those guys, you know, and I know those guys because specifically yeah. of that track, Tear on Tape. And whenever, you know, the, the first, like, maybe two-thirds of the of the song is, you know, like several of your other songs. But then at the end, like, you start naming off all these groups. And I remember pausing it and writing it down <laughs> and then push and play and hear the next group. And I wrote it down. And I had a list and I went to, you know, our Christian bookstore and I had to try to find every one of these albums so I could listen. Oh, yeah. But like, I thought, man, that's really cool. That, that's oh, that's good. That's cool, that's man. We're supposed to roll, like helping and supporting our friends instead of saying, hey, I got a record contract. But you guys just, you know, good luck. You know, you were helping out your buddies. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. And it introduced a lot of us to some other. Uh, yeah, people. man. I could, I could, I could, I could have took that attitude easily, but it wasn't. That's, I mean, how can you be a soldier if it's just you? <laughs> exactly. I'm a soldier for Christ, man. You know, it's just you, you know, you're not, you know. So as we said before, it's been 28 years since this album has dropped. Um, have any of- I didn't even know it was that long until you sent me that. <laughs> it shocked me too, it made me feel a little bit <laughs> myself. <laughs> um, have any of your perspectives uh, that you expressed in the album uh, in 1992, have any of those changed or evolved since uh, you did those songs? You know, that's a good question, man. Uh, I wouldn't say they changed my perspective. I would say my artistic 
views have changed. Like, man, I wish I would have rocked that a different way. Or <laughs> I, would, I wish I would have did that over a better beat. I hate that beat, you know. I, but the stuff I was saying, <laughs> the stuff I was saying uh, was pretty, you know, pretty spirit felt to, to this day. I, I feel a lot of that stuff. I just, I'm looking at it more of a, it irks me because I'm an artist and I hate the way I, I'm like, oh, I hate the way that sounds, man. And then, oh, I could have delivered that way better, you know? Yeah. So, but as far as the content and, you know, the things yeah, I was saying in there. From my life, you know, I started preaching whenever I was like 14 years old. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it wasn't pretty, you know, <laughs> and probably for about the first 10 years, it was pretty ugly. And a lot of what I learned to do was by watching other dudes on, on TV or listening on the radio or, you know, whatever. And I just tried to emulate that. But as I look back, I look at some of those, I came across right. an old Bible. Whenever I was back in the States, I came across an old Bible that my mama had and I'm flipping through it. And one of my sermon notes popped out of it. And I looked at it and I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, what was I teaching? Theologically, <laughs> I heard right, something right. on the radio and I was talking nonsense. <laughs> and these poor people right. had to listen to it. <laughs> and so like, I think for me, like theologically, like I've, I've developed and grown and I still believe the core things that, you know, I taught back then, but I think that I've, I've evolved. And I think, you know, be getting married and having children, all that changes you, you know, and, and yeah. you well from different perspectives. So that's really well. Kind of I'll tell you, Jay. There's like a that off of that album, and I think you mentioned it too in your comments. Uh, off of that album, that "Kill the Spirit" song is like that's what everybody always still talks about, <laughs> and they, they it's, and they they you know, I have even mainstream secular people still tripping off of that song because of the way we broke down how, you know, uh, the, the word nigga is actually a spirit because it's a character that comes behind that word mm -hmm. and it carries. And the way we broke it down in that song, man, it's like, I, I just think it's timeless and it was needed to hear and it still needs to be heard, man, because that's an attitude. It's a character and an attitude. And that's what needs to change. Yeah, I agree. I think I think I would uh, differ with you a little bit theologically on it. I think that you know um, Peter Wagner and kind of the territorial spirits thing. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I like some of those ideas, but I don't really find it as strongly in Scripture. But what mm -hmm. I do find in Scripture is our sin nature, and like yeah. I, I think you know that that if if that's what we're talking about, and I'm on the, absolutely on the same page. Because I know that some of the same characteristics that you mentioned in the song are characteristics that I, as a white man, also am tempted towards. You know, right. I feel like that it, this is my sin nature. This is my decision to rebel against God. And any time that we rebel against him, this is what we find ourselves in. You know, find ourselves in trouble. We find ourselves, we find ourselves in. Trouble. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I was really curious about that song. And I'm sure you get lots of comments and I'm going to throw these guys under the bus a little bit um, <laughs> because you know, this, uh, this generation is very <laughs> deep and like there are certain things you can say and certain things that you can't I'm say. I'm sorry. Hey, you, you broke up for a minute. Okay. You got me now. Okay. So yeah, I got you, man. So this generation is really PC and like, there are things that you can say and the things that you can't say. And whenever they mm -hmm. heard the, that song, uh, they were a little shook. Is that, a, is that a good word? Right. It's back. Yeah. Um, and th I think that there's a level of like, we don't really want to talk about this because we have black friends that, that would be offended if we discuss this song and, and oh, different yeah. things like that. But my perspective, as which is, people, which, which is weird to me, which is weird to me, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why they would be offended, but yet they, I mean, how are you going to, you guys call each other all day long, yeah. but you're telling me, Oh, but you can't say that word. Yeah. It's like, come on, man. But Don't you shouldn't that, say it either then. That my perspective <laughs> on it was like, you know, these are hard topics. Uh this is, it is a hard topic. You know, yeah. this is this is soup talking about his experiences and the things that he's seen. And like none of us can can negate his experiences. We can listen, we can learn, um, but then we can also have a Christ honoring conversation about it. 
you know, and, and yeah. we can discuss these things and challenge our beliefs and challenge, you know, what all of us believe and what we say, does these things match? And I will say this though, I'm going to redeem you guys. I threw you under the bus. I'm going to, I'm going to pull you out from under the bus now. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of it had to do too, is that they were having a hard time understanding the lyrics because it's not, they didn't have like the, the right. lyrics in front of them. And so I found them online and, and sent them to them and let them read it while they were listening. Really? They actually have our lyrics online. Yeah, I found it. That's the only song I found. And so um, I let so them listen hilarious. to it. After they were finished listening to it, they were like, okay, yeah, now that I understand what he's saying, I'm okay with it. Um, right. Now, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Mostly? Yeah, we talked about like the, the bigger theological perspective too. Yeah. But like once we could really understand like all the verses, we saw the words and stuff, it gave a bigger picture and context for what you guys were actually saying on the song. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because yeah. it was hard to get the full picture without seeing all of the lyrics and you yeah. know, just mm -hmm. trying to piece together the, you know, yeah. the more. Also, the first time I listened to the album as a whole, it was like midnight. <laughs> I was like half asleep. <laughs> here in right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was having a hard time keeping up, but. Yeah. Well, it didn't wake you up, man. It didn't get you all hype. <laughs> but yeah, man, that, that that was a that was and still is a pretty uh, controversial, deep song because of the word, the content, I guess. But I mean, that's that's what we where we're from. That's what we deal with, man. That's yeah. that's every day. I think you know. I, I told them later that. You know, I had been listening to your music for so long that I felt like to some degree I knew your heart because I'd heard all these other songs. And so as I heard that song, I heard it, I heard it spoken in love and encouragement. Like, you know, it's time to step out of this uh, poor behavior and, you know, learn how to live a life of freedom in Christ. And so I, I guess I saw right. it differently because I had the history, you know, listen to your music and I kind of knew and they didn't have any context really. So. Did I pull you out of which, which is good because that's that because that's what music is, man. You know, everybody's gonna perceive it a certain way and get something out of it. And then, you know, cause have you cause uh have you have you ever really uh like listened to a song and then you kind of put it to the side, go back to it, listen, like, hey, I didn't hear that in there, you know? Yeah, <laughs> that, that's kind of like what it is, man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's the beauty of music, you know, it's, yeah. it has its own life, you know. So race relations right now, since we're kind of on this topic, race relations in America, and we don't get to see it because we live here. And, um, right. you know, we're definitely in the minority here. We're kind of in the opposite situation. But race relations right. in the U.S. is at a low point. And I wanted to ask you what you feel like the church's role is in healing and addressing racial pain and division in the U.S. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Forgive me if I like saying this, but... <laughs> I feel the church is probably one of the most segregated spots around. I agree completely. Because, uh, I mean, you go to a black church, it's, that's what it is, a black church. <laughs> you go to a white church, that's what it is, a white church. It's not, there's no, no one's coming together, yep. really trying to talk about things. Now, uh, which I feel this is perfect time for them to be stepping up and doing things they're not out here at these marches you don't hear nobody's coming together these pastors should be coming together right now marching together talking to the people you know make this is their time to stand up and, and make moves and out here it's, it's not happening wow. what you're seeing is churches doing online services with Venmo uh cash app things <laughs> you know, that's what's going on man and to I me, they're missing, to me, they're missing the, their chance to pull races together. We, we, we should be the ones doing this. You know what I'm saying? We should be out there at these marches or whatever is going on. Even if you're not there for the march, there's a, this, you got all these people together right now. Use this opportunity to, to really preach and minister isn't that what ministry is really all about yeah that and i don't i don't see it going on man i can see these cats uh getting they should be really getting together black and white churches and making a stand right now 
I haven't seen that happening at all yet. Yeah, I, I think I'm 100% with you. And I feel like as we look at it from the outside, not being in the States right now, you know, we see it, you know, through the media. But like, I look at it and I say, the church was made for times like this. Like made for times like this, man. <laughs> There's they so should be people. they should be tearing it up. Absolutely, and we're too busy arguing over whether the hurt is real or not, or whether the problem is real or not. Whatever, who cares? Like, the pain is real. And pain is real. Need to be addressing the pain, and I, I I'll be it honest. I'm I'm disappointed in the American. But yeah, I will say this though, man. I will say this. I've seen more. How could I say this and it makes sense? I've seen more compassion and people trying to talk and understand coming from white individuals than I have blacks. I've never seen, I mean, some of my, my white friends calling me like, cat, they don't call me, they text. So, but they're <laughs> calling me <laughs> to talk, hey man, you know, man, Man, I just, it's just, it's, I don't know what's going on right now, man. I just want to tell you I love you, man. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, <they're, laughs> but I was, I started, I didn't really pick up on it until I started paying attention to the, how many of them were hitting me up. It was like, I've never seen my white friends or white people I work with or anything feel the emotion like they're feeling right now towards black people. It's just a trippy vibe out here, man. It's it's a really weird vibe. It's like everyone is in tune with their emotions because everything is shut down. You know, all you have is, you know, you can't go nowhere. You 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 know, you all you have time to do is think and look and study. That's it, really, because you, you know, people aren't working. Yeah. They're uh can't go to church even. All the churches are shut down. Uh so People are, are, it's almost like God is shaking the whole earth, just shaking, you know what I mean? And you're, you're thinking about things that you usually wouldn't even concentrate on. So when this whole Floyd, uh, George, George Floyd thing happened, it hit, it hit people like I've never seen. I mean, because we've been seeing this happen all the time and police getting away with it and all. This is... This is something that's not new. We're always yelling about it, always trying to march about it. But I've never seen the white individuals get behind. And they, they're the ones that really blew this thing up. There's more white people marching than black people. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's deep, man. And being here in Oakland uh, and seeing, uh, seeing it the way it, it, it went down out here, I've never seen it. Never seen it like this. I've never seen the emotion from uh, white people like I am right now. So it, that's, this, is, this is a strange time. It's deep, though, man. And um, that's why I'm even extra talking smack on the church, because this is a perfect opportunity for us to be building together off of all that energy. Yeah, I agree. And I think we get all we can do at this point, you know, is just continue to pray that the church will rise up and, and, you know, see her full potential in this crisis and make a change. So, um, right. To kind of shift gears a little bit, what are your thoughts on the current state of what we used to call holy hip hop? And now I guess you guys call it Christian rap. Like, do you have any thoughts on the current state of what's going on? I don't do they is it back to Christian rap now? Or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't keep up with it. <laughs> you know what, man? I will say this. Uh it's super talented. It, to me, it's to me, holy hip hop right now is even better. They're more styled, produced, and crafty than the the, the secular market, in my opinion. The stuff that's coming out in the holy hip hop market right now is super talented. Yeah. But there's no unity, no real love, none of that is there. It's it's almost like a straight up business competition because now they're making money. When we were doing it, we weren't making money. We didn't have 
no social media. And, you know, even to make a video, it was like $30,000. You know, I, I made a video on my phone uh, last year, on my phone. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it cost me 15 bucks for the app. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So now, I mean, cats, could, they, could, they got YouTube. They could put all their stuff. They don't even need labels and all that stuff like we used to have to have. Yeah. So there's no excuse for it to lack unity and love it's just it's almost like a business right now to, in my opinion that's what i see it lacking compared to what we were doing back in those days we were we were really a family we were moving together if we if there was another group that was coming from another state that was performing in our in california in our area all of us would go to the concert and watch it with them support them hang out with them go to dinner you know what i'm saying yeah. man i can't even get on the list of some of these dudes gigs man <laughs> <That's great. laughs> it's crazy so i know that a lot of these guys and you kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier uh but i think it's really relevant for like our listeners because we're talking about music but we're also really focusing on on mentorship and how you know us more mature and older. Can we say more mature? Let's say more mature, <laughs> not older. More mature Christians uh, have a responsibility to the younger generation to pass on the things that we've learned, uh, not just like in life and work, but like spiritually, to pass on those things and to, to develop them so that the next generation is actually better than we are. You know, they, they, right. they have the skills that we had to maybe work hard for and we passed it on to them and they can pass it on to others. And so, um, Whenever it comes to mentorship, are there any of these guys that, that you mentored or how did, number one, how did you mentor other rappers? And number two, uh, are there any of these guys that you mentored that to this day, you're just like super proud of them? Uh, not necessarily work-wise, but like in their life and their day-to-day -day walk with Christ and those things. Yeah, man. Um, well, first off, before I say that, you got to understand the, uh, hip-hoppers have attitudes <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> they're very pride we're very prideful and all that you know so there's a certain way you have to approach you can't just say to somebody hey i'm going to show you the game i'm going to teach you unless they come to you and say that they want to be taught yeah. because hip in hip-hop everybody likes to take well yeah you know i developed this this is me you know it's my style you know that's 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 the attitude so i didn't i approached it in a different way i showed them what i was doing and they were attracted to it and like i said earlier i would i wouldn't pull you on stage but i would bring you to my gig let you watch how we do it, let you see how we go out and we talk to people and blah, blah, blah. And then either that would move your spirit or it would, if it moved your spirit, then you would ask to, you know, hey man, how can I, you know, I need to learn this. Like, you know, I literally would have dudes tell me that suit, man, I'm, I want to learn from you, man. I, I like the way you move, man. I like the way you're doing this, man. And then that's, that's how my mentoring would start. Yeah. And then, you know, I would, uh, it's interesting that you said that because like, like we said, we're 28 years later, right? I still, some of the guys, you know, we're done. We're done rapping. Cats are done rapping. But I was in putting other things into people. Like, hey, man, we're here doing this, but, you know, money is kind of funny right now. The money's funny. We don't know if it's going to take off what we're going to do. Uh, why don't you start concentrating on what else you could do as well? I was putting those type of seeds in cats. And now two of the dudes that I used to roll with, they're, they're, they, they, they're pastors of big churches. You know what I'm saying? One of the guys is, he went to school, went to college. He, he's like a, a, a big dude that takes care of people's money. I forgot the name of that, but, <laughs> but, I'm, all I'm trying to say is I I mentored cats to think beyond this, to, yeah. to understand that we're here, but we may be moving over here. 
like me, I, I had a career, you know? I, I got, I, I'm, a, I'm an electrician now. I'm 18 years into it, you know what I'm saying? But I had to go to school for five years right in the middle of my last record. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to school, recording. And just, but, you know, I was being responsible and, and understanding that the times was changing. And I didn't really understand why we weren't making this type of money that we felt we should have made. But at the same time, I was, I could have took, you know, I started getting, I started getting offers, art sellout offers. Like, well, hey man, how come you, you know, tone it down a little bit, come over here and we'll, we'll break you off. Come on and do this type of rap. You know what I'm saying? I said, I'm like, nah, nah, that's not me, man. I'll, I'll bow down and, and leave the game before I come out another way. And kind of like just, that would have just ruined every one of those records, to, in my opinion. You know what I'm saying? If I'd have came out in a secular way and just kind of like just to make money, nah, man, I wouldn't have been happy. So when I mentored cats, I was mentoring cats about the whole picture, not just this rap, not just this rap thing, life. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to name any names, but there was one dude who didn't, he didn't, you know, he didn't listen to me. He, uh, a couple of years ago, was having some serious hard times. And while we were talking, he told me, he says, man, I wish I would have listened to you when you was telling me to get into the game. Because I told him to follow me into the electrical side. and. You know, it was just weird. It was just a trip to hear him say that as a grown man to me that he wishes he would have listened and took heed to what I was trying to say back then. Because to tell you the truth, I didn't even really know what I was saying. I think it was the spirit of God just moving, man, because I was just telling cats about the moves I was making and what and I saw gifts in, in certain in these certain dudes that hey you should you should go to school hey man you got a you got a calling on you for for speaking man the way you remember you memorize you read these scripts and you you don't never have to read it it's like your your brain is crazy you should look into that and and these and some of these cats did yeah that's awesome and they moved in their gifts man yeah I had the same you know experiences like uh, with young missionaries that that I've mentored. And you look back, you know, years later, uh, they're a pastor of a church, they're doing this, they're doing that. And, you know, you just kind of feel blessed that God allowed you to be a part of that. You know, you know that, you know, hey, uh, maybe one thing yeah. I said or, you know, encouragement that I gave them might have been something that kind of encouraged them down that path. Uh, and I think that's kind of the, the way we have to look at mentorship is knowing that ultimately God's moving them in, a, in different directions. But like, we have to do our part too. You know, we have to be able to say those hard things, have those hard conversations that sometimes people don't want to have. I got one, one more question. Amen. Um, and if you guys have any back, any follow-up questions, you're welcome. But uh, I want to know uh, if you stay in touch with QP and Dove and if there's a chance ever of a uh, uh, reunion album. <laughs> Well, I'm 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 in touch with QP often. That's my boy. Dove, we don't know where Dove's at, man. Ain't nobody talked to Dove in like five, six years, man. We don't even know where he's at. So. <laughs> he's not even on social media, man. Really? Uh, I, I I stay in touch. You know, yeah, Dove. You know, my prayers go out to him, man. I don't I don't know where Dove's at. <laughs> um, but um, uh, reunion album, man. I just. You know what? It's funny that not a reunion album, but there may be reunion uh, tour. Does that make sense? Not an album, but a tour with us rocking gigs. And you know who was trying? Who's trying to bring that to life is uh, T Bone. Okay. Yeah. So we'll see what happens, man. And I, you know, I told him I'm with it 100. percent You know, I just gotta, you know, get my car up, you know, start eating right. <laughs> start listening to my music so I can remember some of my songs. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Just, but, a, uh, just a little uh, fact that I will be home in, in 2022. So if there's any possible way that that reunion happen in 22, I'll be there. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, that would be. Did you guys have any yeah. questions? So yeah, that that that's the way it would uh it would go down. So I want to let. Come you on, man! I know you got one, man. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've been listening to Eargasmic Arrangements. I guess you put that out in 2016. Uh, I'm loving Eargasmic it. Arrangements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was my last album. It's great. That's no, that great. came out in 2000, man. Did it? Yeah, I just put it on. Uh, it was just that was my last album on, on my own independent label. Yeah, that came out in 2000. Yeah, I just got it I, I, when I was doing my research. I came across it, so I was like, let me let me check it out, and I really dig it, man. I think it's really good stuff. And then yeah, that was probably uh, one of my best albums, in my I, opinion, my I best think works. It's, man, I think it's it's legit. And then I heard another track that you were on with Proxy, uh, and it looked like it came out this year. Now that did come out this year, yes. I can't stop listening to that to that song, man. That's a good song. Yeah, that's a nice song. He's got everybody on that song, man. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good kid, man. Kid, man. Uh, another cat I kind of mentored up. If we since we're talking mentor things, <laughs> and uh, the dude is uh, I'm so proud of him, man. He's doing. He's just a beautiful soul, man. That's awesome, man. Well, I'm glad to see that you're still doing what you were doing back then, man. And you know, our hey, real quick, man. Yeah, go ahead. My man right here, my yeah. brother. Did you say you you were born in '96? Yeah, yeah, I was. <laughs> man, my son was born in '96. <laughs> well, yeah, well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious, man. You see what I gotta do? <laughs> the older I get, the younger my missionaries get, and I'm like, hey, but let me, but but let me tell you, man, because of my son. Uh, I don't know if you know I have a book out. Uh, I, I wrote a book. I couldn't be able to buy it. Yeah, let me let me see. Do I have a copy here? Hold on a sec. Yeah, so this, this is my book, man. Sweet. And uh, it's called uh, Through My Windows, The History Behind Holy Hip Hop. I wrote this book for my son because he was too young to understand what was going on. Yeah, yeah. And he kept, he had a gang of questions. Yeah. And uh, I had a little treasure chest for him with all this stuff in it. And uh, someone kept telling me, like, man, you need to write a book, man. Put it in a book, dog. I said, yeah, you know, here it is. And this was for my son. So, yeah, yeah that's I like to hear, I, I, I like to hear, I like, I like to, hear from the uh, younger cats man because they trip out on that book man when they start reading and see the way what we went through and what how the whole industry went down you know and that uh lecrae and the cross movement wasn't the first ones <laughs> <laughs> well hey um i i tried i went online i didn't see that you had written a book but i couldn't find a way to get it um, well it's only it's only available all the hard copy is sold out yeah. And uh, because of the COVID-19, we, we can't even reprint. Okay. Uh, so it's only, a, it's only available on an e-book form on Amazon. Amazon. All right. Yeah, that's it. Hey, that works for us since, yeah, you know, so we're halfway across the world <laughs> from y'all. There it is, man. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, e-books all day, man. Cool. Cool. Uh, well, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read your book. But I'm also going to send you my book. If you can just send me an email with your address. And, and oh, I'll most definitely. The, the book I wrote, man, just free charge. Let you check it out if you might enjoy it. Um, I would love to, man. And I'd love Especially to Especially a guy that you. Uh, freeze up. Yeah. There he is. You froze up. What'd you say? <laughs> oh, I said. I would love to read it, especially from a guy who used to listen to my raps. <laughs> <laughs> man, it's been great chatting with you. And uh, I can't right, wait man. to tell my, my high school friends who I got to talk to tonight. <laughs> so, um, hey, can I pray for you before we go? Yes, man. Please do. All right. Uh, Lord, I just want to thank you uh, for this opportunity to be able to, to talk to Soup today and to hear a bit of his story and his perspective on life and the things that you've done through his life. And uh, I know that you've used his, his life and his work to impact me whenever I was younger. And, you know, I've shared it with others and shared it with my kids. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless the work of his hands and the things that he has done both in art 
uh, as well as just his day-to-day -day job, Lord. Give him opportunities to be able to speak into people's lives and to give them the hope of the gospel uh, in whatever way and, and form that, that you give him the opportunity to do. Uh, I pray for his family, that you would bless them and that you would allow them to, to prosper in life, but also to prosper spiritually and to, and to grow and to be near to you. Uh, Lord, I want to pray for Dove tonight. We don't know where he is or, or what's going on, Lord, but we know that you know where he is and you love him. And Lord, we pray that, that he would feel that love tonight and, and would feel that compulsion to come back um, and to, to reconnect with his friends and, and, and let people love on him and care for him. And Lord, we pray for all these young rappers that are, that are around today, Lord. We pray that they would have the same spirit of unity that these guys had back in the 90s um, and that that would be uh, something that, uh, that soup could pass on to these other guys. Um, Lord, we love you. We thank you for letting us be a part of a huge family uh, that is so distinct and different, uh, but yet we all have the same mission. And Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity tonight and pray that you bless Soup and his family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, and I, I just want to thank you guys, man, for reaching out to me, man. And you too. Stay with it, man. I'm very... It's a blessing to see how young you are out there doing this, man. It's, that's a serious sacrifice. And, uh, you know, I thank you, man. I thank you guys for going out there, ministering to these people like this. You guys are a blessing and, and encouraging to me right now. Well, thanks. It was really encouraging to listen to you and, and see how the Lord has used your gifts over your life and the way that you have mentored and, and shared in your song. It was, it was really cool. Yeah, it's been awesome to get to talk to you tonight. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, really we've barely talked about, we're just listening and it's been a huge blessing yeah. to hear your, your words. And so thanks for sharing your wisdom and being willing to talk with us. We really appreciate it.